That's not how I trained it. Hey, hey kids, how are you? Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't what I dreamt. <laughs> but we'll get there, I'm working on it. You mentioned Greatest Showman. It was the inspiration for this entire convention. We started with, with it. Um, so grateful to have you here. It seems like the most obvious Hollywood movie to ever make is a huge hit. Um, but it wasn't. It took you a while to get made, and even at the end, people were, were doubters. Can you give us a quick backdrop on that? It took us eight years to get it made. We had a first-time director. I did, uh, I, I met him years back. I, I, it's a quite a funny story, I'll tell you a quick story. So when I met him, we were doing a commercial together for something. And at the end of it, I said, oh, mate, we should do a movie together. And he goes, yeah, whatever, Jackman. And I said, no, you don't have to do a movie with me if you don't want it. He goes, no, but every actor at the end of a shoot, I don't know if it's just what they say, or they, they always end up saying, you know, let's do a movie together. And so for the first 10 years of my career, I would ring my mom and say, I'm doing a movie with George Clooney. I'm doing a movie with DiCaprio. It's happening. And of course, it never happened. So I sent him a script 10 years ago. Uh, two weeks after that, and he rang me back, and he was like, oh, you, you meant that. <laughs> and that started a process. A musical is the hardest thing to make. It always looks easy when you see it, but to have original music, people weren't sure if uh, a story about Barnum, who was 150 years ago, uh, I don't know if that's gonna work, but who's, who are these kids writing? They were kids, they were literally just out of college. Justin and Bench, who also wrote Dear Evan Hansen and other things, they're incredible. But our director, uh, again, don't tell him who it is, but he told a little fib to the studio because they only wanted big names writing the music. And they said, who's this Bench and Justin? They said, oh, they're huge. He goes, what do you mean they're huge? This is the studio executive he was talking to. He goes, well, they just want a Tony Award. He goes, a Tony Award, what for? The James and the Giant Peach. And there's never been a Broadway production of James and the Giant Peach. <laughs> but they don't know that in Hollywood, so... The Hollywood exec went, okay, great, right, that's right. So, when we made, the, we got our green light for the movie four weeks before we started. So we were just going, we were just believing, we were just like, about a year before, and this is my wife again, who is always right. I was saying, I don't know if we're gonna get this across the line. I don't know if we're gonna get there. I'm, I'm worried about this, and I'm worried, I don't know if the studio believe in it, I'm worried about this, and she said, stop. You've either gotta believe in this fully and make it happen, or you've gotta step away. And I was like, oh. So, I went to bed. Turn on my Totero vaporizer. <laughs> and I started visualizing the movie being a big hit and happening and changing people's lives, particularly kids' lives. And I would imagine that every single day. And, well, the rest is history. So. <laughs> but, there was a little moment of doubt. I don't know if you know this, but when we opened, when the movie opened, we were, I believe, the second worst opening of any movie that opens on 3,000 screens or more. Except in Utah. We <laughs> have, really. It just, you know, there was Jumanji, there was Star Wars, there was Pitch Perfect 3, we were, anyway. And my wife said, it's gonna happen, I feel it, don't worry. About two weeks later, our box office went up. Now in Hollywood, box office only goes down. Okay, opening weekend and down. We went up, 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 and we ended up doing $500 million worldwide. Um, and the album, nine months later, is, I believe, as of last week, still number one on iTunes. So. I felt super braggy when I said that, but sorry. But I just had that little brag there for a second. <laughs> Thank you, man. Thank you. In the words of Dave, Stur Dave Sterling, I think we're going to go a little over. Is that okay? <laughs> I, I 
just had an idea. I've got a little request. Can we have some more Utah people as Hollywood executives, please? That's what we need. <laughs> That's the message. One thing I've been really impressed with is, uh, obviously, I think your wife was maybe the lead, uh, is your commitment to charitable work, uh, World Vision, uh, with the, the Worldwide Orphanage, the problem of travel to Asia and Africa and other countries. You bring your kids with you. Um, it, it changed our family's life when we brought them to Guatemala for our co-impact sourcing. My daughter Lucy made a video that still makes me cry. You can find it, Lovely Lucy Guatemala. Oh, but make sure you put Guatemala. If you just do Lovely Lucy, it is not good. Please put it. <laughs> All three words are very important. <laughs> that reminds me of my friend who told his mother to get a Gmail account, and so she Googled G-M-A-L-E, and she went, I do not want that account. <laughs> Uh, but can you tell us a little bit about what that commitment and, and family commitment to charity has, has done for your family? Well, I'm glad you mentioned the word family. I was brought up um, in, in the church from when I was five. My father, I remember, it was a big deal. I got 10 cents pocket money. And my father used to sit down and break down the 10 cents with me on a sheet of paper. Two cents for entertainment, two cents for candy, da da da, and one cent, 10% of the money, to the church. And so, as I got older, he said, and that's up to you, I would also encourage, on top of your 10, 10%, I would encourage 10% back to the community, or charity work. Both my parents always did charity work, volunteering. My father, when he retired, went and worked uh, as an organization the executives overseas. So he was an accountant for startups in third world countries, just sharing his knowledge and he did it for free. Um, my mother still volunteers at the, the cafe, the, the uh, Good Samaritan Cafe in, in, in England where she lives. So my point being, I grew up with it. It is natural to me. I think it should be natural to, and I think as parents we need to show that to our children that we, yeah. Um, of course you have to look after your immediate family and beyond that the rings of influence just grow and so you look after your own town where you live and do things volunteering and then your country and your civic duty to your country and then the world and it, if you're doing things right you're brought your kids up right I think those those rings or those circles just grow and grow and grow and of course anyone and yeah, I'm counting everyone in this room who does that realize the more you give, the more you get back. Sure. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I've got to mention this. My background is politics, and uh, in just about a month, a little over a month, the front runner is about to come out. I am more excited for this movie of yours than probably any in advance. It's about the failed presidential candidacy of Gary Hart, 1988. Uh, I remember everything about it very well. Um, I, I was reading some articles yesterday, and today you've got, uh, they're looking at you as, uh, as an Oscar nominee, award winner potentially. Uh, incredible reviews. Uh, can you tell me quickly why you decided to be a failed U.S. presidential candidate? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't think it matters if you're where you are in the world, where you live, or what side of the political fence you count yourself on. There seems an element today where people feel, how do we get to this part of the world? I'm not just talking about America, you know. How do we get so divided? How do things, how do we get to this place? Um, and this is a three week period of American history, which I didn't know much about growing up. But it weirdly, putting the lens under those three weeks, you see a huge turning point. A turning point in how presidential candidates were positioned in the press, their duty to public, and ultimately the movie is about the difference between what is interesting and what is important. And of course that is different for everybody, and the movie doesn't ever try to say what is important. But it's just trying to get us 
to stand back and go, what is really important and what flaws will I accept in my leaders? I can't wait. Please vote wherever you are and please see that movie on election day. I know they're watching in Utah. I know that. Well, we will beat California again, I think. <laughs> My la I have two just kind of final personal requests. I'm up here, what can they do? One, I've always kind of wanted to be in a movie with you, but would you just do one script with me? It's very short, okay? <laughs> Logan, when they come out, does it hurt? <laughs> Every time. <laughs>
Bye.